Hello, I'm very glad to join you for this 50th anniversary gala of the Hastings Center. I'm very grateful to Millie's invitation and I'm going to give a brief address about artificial intelligence and how it can have a big effect in healthcare uh, with lots of caveats, of course. Before I get into that, I just want to point out that 45 years ago, I was writing about the Hastings Center. So I've had great admiration for Hastings Center and its influence in ethics around the world. And this was a thesis I wrote when I was at University of Virginia in 1975 about prospects for genetic therapy in man. It took a little while for it to actually get real, but uh, indeed it has. And along the way, the Hastings Center, along with every other critical ethical dilemma, has been a key influential force. So in medicine today, the short-term importance of artificial intelligence is to get us to a much better place with respect to accuracy and precision. These days, precision medicine is the buzzword, but it's no good if it isn't accurate also. And we are very short of that. So artificial neural networks where inputs of data with respect to particularly imaging in healthcare, but more over time will be speech and eventually text. Those inputs can act like neurons in our brain and the outputs can make for training machines to come up with uh, things that humans can't do or, or do nearly as well. So an example of that would be a chest x-ray where a radiologist misses a nodule, which turns out to be cancerous. And this has been shown to be the case in many studies of images. This is just a chest x-ray example. Here's mammography, a similar thing, where even expert mammographer radiologists will miss things. But by training with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of images as inputs, the neural networks can get so good at picking up things and making the diagnosis or the interpretation more accurate. The best way I can convey that is through the retina picture. This retina picture could be shown to international experts in the retina and ask them whether it's from a male or a female. And they would say 50% chance uh, of, be, of being right, whereas a neural network can be trained with 97% accuracy. Yes, there are better ways to determine uh, gender, but this just shows you how images can be dis discerned by uh, algorithms, by neural networks, in ways that people, experts, can. So when a machine sees in the retina is a gateway of things we never realized that could be seen. So for example, tracking kidney disease, tracking diabetes, blood pressure, Alzheimer's disease, and when to intervene in someone with macular degeneration. These are things that we couldn't see as humans, as even experts, clinicians, but we can now start to see how the, this picture uh, has immense information encoded that machines can pick up. As a cardiologist uh, throughout my career, I love to read cardiograms, but I never imagined you could tell the age of the patient the gender of the patient, whether the patient is anemic and how severe, as well as the heart function, and also be able to make difficult diagnoses, all through AI. And the same is for pathologists on a slide, to be able to pick up the driver genomic mutations that are causing the cancer. So this is pretty extraordinary uh, that we couldn't imagine a slide would have so much information in it that would be missed by a person, but picked up by a machine. So that just gives you a sense across every clinician type, every discipline of medicine, this will have a marked important impact. Here's a colonoscopy, and gastroenterologists have done some of the leading work in the field, where during the, gastro, uh, the endoscopy, the gastroenterologist is picking up things through machine vision that otherwise would be missed, and in real time, telling their gastroenterologist whether it could be cancerous or not, and being able to avoid biopsies or to do the biopsies that are actually indicated. So 
it's not just across all medical disciplines, it's also across the health span from in vitro fertilization all the way to uh, being able to predict the prognosis of patients who are in the hospital and so many different things uh, along the health span. So to summarize for clinicians, this quote is quite apropos. Machines will not replace physicians, but physicians using AI will soon replace those not using it. But it's not just about doctors. It's also about patients. So now, even a few years ago, the first deep learning algorithms were approved by the FDA for detecting heart rhythm abnormalities like atrial fibrillation. And now we're seeing many more, such as urinary tract infection, self-diagnosis with an AI kit, skin lesions, ear infections in children, all sorts of things where autonomy of patients, not doctor less, but at least getting the initial diagnosis then to be confirmed uh, by a physician uh, and if need be, treatment be uh, uh, prescribed. Eventually, each person will have the ability to have a virtual medical coach with all their data from many different sources, whether it be uh, their scans, their sensors, their electronic health records, uh, the medical literature, all being processed and fed back uh, to a person to coach them from either preventing an illness they were at high risk to have or even to have better management of a chronic condition. My favorite device, uh, which now is getting very into AI, is the smartphone ultrasound because this is quite remarkable. The images that one can obtain by plugging in a probe to the base of a smartphone. Here's the heart, everything you'd want to know about the heart within seconds. This transcends the era of lub-dub stethoscopes because here we can actually see everything. And this is uh, quite remarkable, not just the heart function, the squeeze power, but also the thickness of the heart muscle, the valves, the size of the cavity, the chambers, and even tracking the blood flow of the heart. This is so extraordinary that I, I decided to use this on every part of my body, as you can see here, a medical selfie with smartphone ultrasound, all the way from the carotids, the sinuses, thyroid, the lung, the heart, liver, kidney, gallbladder, iliac artery, spleen, aorta, inferior vena cava, popliteal fossa, and my left foot, all within minutes. And why is this important? Because now, with AI, it can guide an individual who has no idea what, what they're doing in acquiring the image to say, move the probe up or down or clockwise or counterclockwise, and it automatically can capture the image and label it and in help interpret it. So this is a pretty remarkable advance that we're starting to see in AI going forward. And that would be the case for anyone in the world to be able to do AI of, of uh, imaging of any part of the body except for the brain because of the skull. And this is already starting to take place in remote places in Africa and India. So that gets me to the point of this could reduce inequities, AI, but it also could worsen them, of course. And this is a very good uh, principal AI uh, white paper that was put out by the Berkman Klein Center. And it touches on all the key things like privacy and fairness and security, accountability, all the things that we need to strive for, which we're not there yet with AI. And in fact, this is a really good paper in the New England Journal in June, which goes through 12 different algorithms that have embedded bias, racial bias, not because the algorithms are at fault, but because it's embedded in our real world. And we need to be very aware of this when going forward with AI in healthcare. So just to close a couple of thoughts, it's great that we can help improve accuracy over time. A lot more work needs to be done to validate all that. But what we need the most is not just accuracy. We need to restore the empathy in medicine. That is the human bond, the presence, the trust, this very precious relationship between a, a patient and doctor. And there is no algorithm for that. And Francis Peabody, did a classic, had wrote a classic paper 
almost a century ago. And it's six pages, and it's easily downloadable. And I just turned to the last part where he wrote, one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity. For the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And this is the most exciting future overarching direction for AI in healthcare. We want to give the gift of time that AI could provide by making the, the lives of clinicians much easier uh, and more uh, streamlined, but also giving patients more autonomy and control and engagement in their own health care. This would give the gift of time, and it's the segue to a far better medicine, the essential aspect of the human connection. Let me just acknowledge all the people, the great people I get to work with at Scripps Research and our funding sources, and I very much look forward to our uh, discussion with Millie and to your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for those terrific remarks and not the least for going back to your dissertation to let us know that you were guided by the Hastings Center even back then at the start of your wonderful career. Uh, we all appreciated the shout out. Oh, thanks. Really? Really. Yeah, it was 45 years ago. Hastings was already having a powerful influence. Yeah. This really feels good to know that. Thank you. And those video images you just shared, they make it really clear that machine learning or AI within healthcare is revolutionary in terms, at least, of yielding earlier and more accurate diagnostic information. And I loved the examples uh, in lung cancer and breast cancer diagnosis and real-time colonoscopy guidance. I didn't expect to be seeing that on our gala. That was really very interesting. And radiology, too. It's exciting to see that the benefits of AI are already being realized in so many different contexts. But then, Eric, at the end, um, you ended with comments in which you, you made a connection. You, you claimed, you made a claim, and, and I'd like you to spell it out a little bit more. You suggested that AI will not only give us earlier and more accurate diagnoses, but that it can also, I don't know how to put it, help repair modern medicine, so to speak that you're hoping it can actually enhance physicians' capacities for empathy and in more humanistic medicine. And I wondered if you could connect the dots for us. How do, sure. why, are, why is that likely to follow? Well, it, it won't happen by accident. The latter, that is the uh, deep medicine, the idea that we could restore the, the precious relationship. So, you know, back when I was in medical school and my early uh, training, uh, there was a precious, intimate relationship between a doctor and a patient. Uh, and that was something that uh, I think represented the essence of medicine. It's a human connection. The problem is that over time, all these decades since, there's been constant erosion of that, which has been accelerated in the electronic health record era with keyboards and not even looking at patients, but also the administrative takeover of American medicine, especially, whereby the squeeze on clinicians to see patients very quickly, and patients are getting shortchanged. They don't even have a time to express uh, what's bothering them because they get interrupted within seconds. They don't get listened to. There's no trust and presence, uh, and everything is just different than it used to be. So what we're talking about with AI is not just what you cited, which is we can really rev up accuracy, that is clear. But the more far-reaching objective is to the gift of time. That if we, when we get together, a patient and a clinician, that we actually have the time to really listen, to be present, to express compassion and empathy, which the reason why we went into medicine, right? Mm -hmm. But we lost it and that's why there's a global crisis and burnout now. Uh, so I, I, I'm optimistic, but it will ha have to be done by activism because otherwise American medicine, especially is run by administrators who they have to answer to financial business, uh, criteria. Whereas it, it, the people that are actually on the front lines have a different mission. You know, in my introduction to you earlier, I, I drew attention to the fact that you have been calling for activism, physician activism, and you've 
you know, basically called out the idea that uh, you don't think we should be thinking about trade guilds that are, are protecting um, physicians, but rather mobil physicians mobilizing on behalf of the inspirational reasons that they went into medicine and on behalf of their patients. So let's assume that progress is made in that direction. What should we be advocating for? How, again, it's kind of the question of what should be put in place if AI is going to help realize a more humanistic medicine? What are the things you'd like people to call for? Well, I think if physicians stand up and, and along with them, the whole healthcare team, nurses and you know, all the different professionals and say, you know, we want the gift of time. We're not gonna see patients in seven minutes. So that reminds me of a really interesting story uh, that occurred in Geisinger Health System. Uh, and what was interesting there is they had a, um, a uh, rule for a stretch uh, that you, you had to spend 40 minutes with a patient and you couldn't leave the room, neither the patient nor the doctor, unless you had gone 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, what's really fascinating about this is uh, it was hard for the doctors because they, they weren't used to spending so much time with patients. Ultimately, they loved it and the patients loved it. And so the gift of time here is what I think is central. So what's going to happen if we do this right, really, is a lot of visits can be done, routine visits that are not essential uh, could be done remotely and rapidly. Uh, and also a lot more autonomy to patients because they can do a lot of the gathering of data, generating data and algorithms themselves over time. But the critical meetings that take place shouldn't be rushed. They should go to their natural uh, extent of what it takes to listen and to respond and to you know, have a true meaningful uh, bond and interaction. So that's the hope is if we work on that and we fight for that, and we don't let these people that are the bean counters uh, prevail. Um, and we, I think we can get there. But, you know, it, otherwise what it'll turn out, Millie, is it'll go the opposite direction. Now that you have all this AI power, see more patients. Yeah. You know, you, you see, read more scans, yeah. read more slides. You can just imagine, do more procedures. Like, you know, those colonoscopy, you go faster now because you have machine vision. So I want you to do twice as many now you can make more money so we have to buck that because it could be abused just as much as it can be um exploited uh for you know positive good things we can call it activism and we could also call it professionalism good old-fashioned professionalism to set limits on authority over one's own practice yes i think that's a great way to put it I like that um Eric, you know, you've written a lot about, you know, how it could go both ways and that there are a lot of ethical issues that we do need to address. And the first one I'd like to put on the table is, is the issue of fairness. And I'd love for you to address fairness at two levels, organizationally and at the individual level. And what I mean by that is organizationally, we already have a two-tiered system. I think you'd agree. You know, there are wealthy hospitals and sophisticated academic medical centers that are developing or purchasing AI tools right now. You've shown us some of them. Um, but also, poor health systems or health systems serving the poor, especially in rural areas of the country, that are not as likely to be able to get these tools. So could transformative AI further bifurcate our health system? And then at the individual level, might inequality be exacerbated because the patient-generated data that you're talking about is mainly going to come through smart apps that like a like people's watches or other apps that they have in their home and and those are tend to really be used by the wealthy so do you see this as an issue and and what recommendations would you have for how we handle this right well i think this is central that we could make uh things not just very unfair worse than inequities uh all sorts of adverse effects of AI, but we're not using the things we have um, in the right way. So for example, you know, with Moore's law over the last 50 plus years, you know, the cost of smartphones, uh, apps, software uh, is trivial relative to, you know, one visit to an emergency room. You, you can't go to an emergency room with a charge less than a thousand dollars 
where you just think about one night in the hospital, it charges over $5,000 in the US. So if we just gave people smartphones who couldn't afford them and apps and data plans for years, we could afford years, we could give them uh, a lot more autonomy, prevent um, having to go to the hospital. And we've already seen now uh, around the world um, how you could utilize these algorithms and AI tools in the hinterlands of Africa and India and other places. So it's a matter of getting the hardware and the software to the people who need it. And, the, you know, we don't, we're not smart about this. This is cheap stuff. I mean, you can get a, a smartphone that doesn't have all the bells and whistles, maybe that many people have, but it's highly functional for $50. And your data analysis plans, you know, we could, we should be working on companies to give people who can't afford analysis plans, just like people that can't get prescriptions, they can't afford the prescriptions. We should have plans for people who can't afford data analysis, uh, I mean, uh, data plans. So, you know, we're not being creative about this and we need to be. Uh, now, as far as the fairness, you know, we have a problem of uh, uh, systemic uh, racism and that systemic racism gets into algorithms and AI, but it isn't the AI's fault. It's because it's embedded. Yeah. So we can't blame AI for that, really. We can just blame, hey, we got a problem. We need to fix this. And I hope that we will address that because that is, you know, of uh, utmost importance and it's overdue. So, you know, there are lots of things we could do that we're not doing right now to get us on the right track. Thank you for raising the bias issue. I think, you know, people, um, hear that a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a theme in a lot of the ethics literature that people have been talking about. I saw a really interesting study where people wanted to identify patients who were going home, they were being discharged, and wanted to find the people who could most benefit from some sort of home care plan. But they chose the wrong metrics. They decided that they were going to identify people who were high cost. And, uh, and, and, it, and they missed a large proportion of the African Americans who were not high cost, but who were equally sick or sicker and required, would have benefited from the home care, but they weren't, uh, cost should, was the wrong metric to, to use because they were already being under, they were already under utilizing services. So they came up as less costly, not because they were less sick. So it's- That's it's, the most famous recent example that's the paper in Science uh, by Zia and Obermeyer, which is just, um, it's, it, it, that was used by Optum in millions of people, tens of millions of people. And it was an embedded uh, issue of inequities because of the assumptions made going into it. So we have to be so conscious and aware of this before implementing any AI. Uh, and the other thing just to mention is, you know, when you have an AI that's functional and validated and you've made sure that it doesn't have, um, you know, uh, embedded uh, unfairness and inequities, then you also have to keep it under continuous surveillance because it could be subject to adversarial attacks. So we're still very early in AI and healthcare. We have a lot to learn, but we have to keep our guard up for sure. You know, we talked about fairness and um, trying to guard against greater in inequality. A third question I have for you has to do with the level of evidence that we should require of AI tools before we let them out the door, so to speak. Several high profile health systems are making very large investments in AI, um, including major purchases from private companies like IBM and Verily. But it's my understanding that we often have very little evidence on the efficacy of these tools or on their safety or whether they are biased or not. Um, they're rarely tested in randomized controlled trials or even evaluated by less stringent measures. So should they be released bef before they've been studied? <laughs> um, we have the FDA for medicines. Do we, need, do we need something stronger for AI? Well, I think so. I think you're really um, you got your finger on an important pulse here, right, right, with this, because what we are relying on to get these commercially uh, approved and used our FDA um, uh, authorizations, you know, they're not approvals, they're 510K clearances. They are retrospective data sets usually, typically. Sometimes they're prospective, but the main point is they're not in the public domain. They don't get published. Mm -hmm. So you basically are relying on, you know, a relatively easy path at FDA to get clearance. It's not even a formal approval. 
and then they're now marketed to health systems. And the people that are using them don't even know the data because it's never been published. So not only do we need you know, rigorous prospective studies to validate in the real world, but we also want to see all this stuff published transparent so that you know when you're buying something that you're actually getting something that you know, it has proven validation that it's likely to work very well because you're also getting at this other issue. This, uh, this could be used in a lot of people, any algorithm, whether it's in radiology, pathology, you name it, it could be used at scale really quickly. And if it's off mm. for some reason, like for example, the patient population was tested in or some of the um, assumptions that went into the models or various steps along the way, it could hurt people at scale too. So this is why uh, I'm very unhappy with the way things are right now because we're not getting the ultimate validation we need before we put trust in algorithms. Like I already mentioned, they need to be under surveillance even after they're used in any health system. But moreover, we want to see any of these get peer-reviewed publication and to be done really well. And th th those are few and far between. I mean, I can count on two hands the papers that I think fulfill that, that ideal um, um, type of uh, validation. So we have a ways to go. So Eric, what, what steps, where do we have leverage here? What, what steps could be taken? I'm wondering I'll, right away what the Hastings Center might be able to do to advance, you know, I mean, we, there must be some source I would imagine that would fund randomized cl clinical trials and other forms of evaluation. What, how, how do you, what do you see as a series of steps to really make progress on this? Well, I think it's a multi-pronged strategy. You're touching on one, which is certainly encouraging the funding of you know, rigorous randomized or at least even prospective trials yeah. that are not yeah. looking at just data that's sitting in computers uh, in silico. Another would be that um, the demand for publication of these results, not just FDA. You see, the, the, they hide behind this proprietary algorithm story, the companies. Well, guess what? Proprietary algorithms, uh, we're, we're not going to accept that. I mean, in fact, this month, there's been a big controversy because Google did publish a breast cancer, uh, you know, a mammography paper, but they didn't uh, have open source to look at the data and the algorithm itself. And so lots of questions about their conclusions. So the point being is we want to have as much transparency as possible. And yeah, we can respect if, if an algorithm has some commercial value, it's proprietary, mm -hmm. but it's also being applied in patients. And as we saw with Optum, in tens of millions of people, that algorithm that le led to, uh, you know, black Americans being uh, unwittingly hurt, uh, financially that is. So, you know, I think we have to do better here to anticipate that uh, we, we're not fulfilling the highest standards and we need to. One really good thing is that there have been new, there was a new uh, process that was organized in the UK this process of the so-called consort and uh, sprint. And they formulated the uh, protocols and reporting standards, very high standards. They were just published you know, in multiple journals last month. And if we adhere to that, and if we make the companies and the academicians all adhere to that, we're gonna have you know, a great uh, future because we won't see this kind of shoddy work that gets implemented in the care of patients. We should talk about that offline. I could talk to you forever, <laughs> see if there's some way that we can bring attention to that. That sounds terrific. Eric, last week I had the great pleasure of presenting the Hastings Center's David Roscoe Award for an early career essay on science, ethics, and society. We created this award to honor a our, our former board chairman, David Roscoe, but also to um, reach out to er people early in their career and interest them in bioethics. The winning essay was by three people, two Princeton PhD students and a pr uh, professor at the University of York in the UK. And it was titled something I think you'll love, Technology Cannot Fix Algorithmic Injustice. And the author... 
I thought you'd really like that. And the authors urged that we not rely simply on software designers and private companies to evaluate technologies and make them as best as they can be made and watch what happens, but to be more proactive up front. And they called for putting some critical questions about AI on democracy's agenda. That was their term. They urged that there are some purposes for which we simply should not develop AI applications, that they would, should be seen as beyond the pale. And they, the example they gave, and I wonder what you think about this, was that citizens put the questions of facial recognition technologies on the agenda in San Francisco. And as a result, facial te recognition technology is no longer used in that city. So that's what they mean by you know, creating de democratic deliberation about issues ahead of time or early on. So I'm wondering when here we are talking about AI within healthcare, not facial recognition, but other, uh, other uses of AI inside healthcare, are there any purposes that you think should be off limits and for which we should mobilize citizens' attention where grassroots civic leadership of the sort we saw in San Francisco would be important? Well, that's a really uh, an important topic as it applies to healthcare too. So we, we've seen now papers that say on facial recognition, it could take a crowd and each person and it can tell their heart rhythm, you know, each person, whether they're in atrial fibrillation or not, or it could look at a photo of anyone and diagnose, you know, whether they have skin cancers. Oh my gosh. Um, so the, the, the reach of algorithms is beyond, you know, our understanding of what is ethically right. And so it's not even just pure facial recognition, which has serious issues, but even with the ability of making diagnoses through it. So, you know, I think these are unsettled uh, areas why we need a Hastings Center really badly. And citizen action, that's part of what we're trying to do in, in, our, in our, you know, in celebrating our 50th, we decided that we were going to really, really re-up and expand what we're doing around citizen involvement. So thanks for the Great. encouragement there. It's oh, you, we, we need you more than ever. I mean, really more than ever. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple more questions and then we'll wind it up. I, I, I loved your piece in, Na I think it was in Nature in 2016 with John Wilbanks. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, he, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it was a great piece on the importance of, of not privatizing all of our data. You expressed great concern that, you know, the tech giants, Google, Apple, Microsoft, were moving into health in ways that would widen inequalities and possibly harm research and unless people could access and share their own data. And I think you talked in that article about the fact, or maybe this happened later, that the EU um, has established, you know, really hard regulations, government regulations, to prevent the collection and analysis of digital health data from becoming a high profit business only. But at the same time in that paper, you also seem to see the value in deploying private capital for innovation and for socially worthy AI. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you see as the positive role for private capital and also what should, what in your view should remain outside corporate ownership? Right, well, you know, it's a two-edged sword having these tech titans come into healthcare and they all have invaded healthcare. You know, uh, certainly uh, we've seen Google, Verily, uh, Apple, um, Microsoft, Amazon. Uh, we're also seeing that with Facebook. They all know this is the next frontier so in some ways we should welcome them because they are putting up big investments they're they're you know hiring a lot of talent to try to address the unmet needs on the other hand privacy of data and as you say mainly worsening inequities all those sort of bad things could get worse too so um we need the the standards in europe of um gdpr for privacy and ownership of data need to be adopted here in the US. We're much too lax. Basically, these companies, while I respect them, uh, you know, they need to be, um, you know, reeled in. They need to be not unbridled as they basically are now. So when they develop big contracts, like the one that occurred between Google and Mayo Clinic, and then there was a, a, a you know, whistleblower within Google saying they were uncomfortable looking at all these de-identified electronic records. I mean, we just don't want that kind of stuff because if you're a patient and, you're, and your uh, records are being reviewed by a tech titan employee, 
you say, huh, you know, I don't really want that person to be looking at my data with my identity, for example. So we, we don't, you know, that couldn't happen right now. That can't happen in Europe because of the standards they've adopted. But we just haven't done it yet. We, we're just like waiting for, you know, problems to erupt and they will unless we tighten things up. Thank you. Um, last question. How can I not ask this question? How might AI help us with the COVID pandemic? Well, it's really interesting you bring that up because you would hope it would help a lot, but I have to say I've been disappointed because there's been many shots on goal and there are some, you know, few things that it's helped in. So for example, in finding drugs, repurposed drugs to apply or even helping in discovery of new drugs. Um, there's been some effort there. There's been efforts in triaging people who come to the hospital as to who helping uh, the doctors and nurses know if their risk are higher by taking in all their data. Um, but, and there's also been the idea of keeping people at home with algorithms so they don't have to go in the hospital yeah. and just follow them with, with um, con con continuous monitoring of vital signs. But I have to say, overall, it's been a disappointment because none of these have really changed the COVID management. We're hoping the project we're doing right now, which is using the smartwatch and fitness bands, and we have a paper coming out uh, in the next couple of days on this, we can identify a COVID signal by re resting heart rate being elevated uh, and less steps and more sleep in a cluster of people, not just at the individual level. Yeah. And since that signal is sharp, and as long as there's not a, a flu season, which it doesn't look like there will be a major flu season, we could hopefully, now we have 40,000 people, we need you know, hundreds of thousands of people around the country. But our effort could help with AI to take that data and say at this particular neighborhood, something is happening. There's a cluster of people that have this signal. And the hope is that AI could predict emerging outbreaks. So, you know, there are many, if there's a long list of AI in the pandemic, but none of them yet, I would say, have fulfilled the goal of making a big difference. We're, we're working on it, but it remains to be seen. And I, I hope by the months ahead, we'll be successful. It seems to me like what we, where we started this conversation. Like there's so much potential, but it can't be AI alone. It has to be embedded in a social system where we agree to either give more time, as we talked about at the beginning, to patients and doctors for their, to, you know, to talk together. And in this case, to believe in the non-medical the non things that we need to do, like wearing masks and socially distancing. But together it could be really powerful if we could all get on the same page. No, absolutely. No, there's so much potential. And, uh, you know, it is, as you say, it's multidimensional. We, we haven't been as successful as we need to be in just getting people to use masks and distance and avoid crowds and indoors and rev up the ventilation. And just as that, we need more people to, to be participants in, in research studies so that we can advance the field. But I'm optimistic. We'll not only eventually prevail from this pandemic, but we'll figure out the right uses of AI going forward. Well, that is a perfect place to, to, to stop. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Eric. Really, it's, it's just a thrill. And I want to thank you so much for helping us celebrate our last 50 years and launch us for our next 50. Thank well, you so much. Congratulations to you, Millie, and to everyone at Hastings Center and all your supporters, because it's such a powerful, influential thought leadership uh, effort. And uh, I'll always be following all, all of that with great interest. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much. Someday sure. I hope to see you in person, my friend. I, I look forward to it. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye now. Thanks.